Hello. Welcome to the Rotten Horror Picture Show, the horror movie podcast where we talk about films off the Rotten Tomatoes 200 Best Horror Movies of All Time list. We started doing the Badass Show again. Oh. And I keep screwing up the introduction on that because I haven't done that one in a while. And you've got this one down yeah, perfectly. I more than once have started that show by saying this introduction and had to stop and do it again. But uh, my name is Clay and with me as always is Amanda. How are you doing, Amanda? I'm good. I'm ready for things to be absurd and fantastical. Excellent. We are back in Italy. We are back in the world of Dario Argento. Today we are talking about 1977's Suspiria, which, uh, you know, sounds really cool as like a word. It's just got like a really cool ring to it. Yeah. I guess guess it just means whisper. Yeah. It sounds a lot more foreboding than that. Is is it whisper or size? Yeah, that too. It's size. Yeah, it's like size or something. I think it has like multiple usages or something. something. But, um, which is, (laughs) it's just kind of funny if, if you, if you know that. If that's your language, mm-hmm. and you see this movie called Suspiria, and it's like, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, scream maybe, yeah, but <laughs> size this is essentially called waiting to exhale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a beautiful, gentle, romantic movie. <laughs> this is uh, number sixty-six on our list. It has an eighty-three percent Rotten Tomatoes score. It's so strange how this works because last mm. week we did, or last time we did horror of dracula which was like in the one somethings yeah and had a 90 something percent score so yeah i think the rotten tomatoes algorithm just also takes into account like how popular something is currently Mm. do you know what i mean like how much attention is it getting how much right yeah Yeah. nobody's talking about nobody's talking about the horror horror of dracula Dracula, i guess yeah it's too bad (laughs) Uh, had you seen this before? We we actually yes. we got to watch it this time mm. a ve- in a very special way. We went yeah. to see uh, <laughs> Claudio Simonetti's Goblin perform the score live. God, it was so good with the movie. We can talk about that more later. But mm. when w- uh, what was the first time you had seen this? I feel like this was on in the background one time when we hung out with a bunch of our friends. Oh, interesting. And I was like, what? <laughs> what is this Mm -hmm. and i had no idea and then i think either probably like you or laura were like oh it's suspiria blah 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 blah." and Mm -hmm. i had known you both for maybe like six months and i was just nice i might go watch this and i think i did i think i like found it online somewhere and watched it like alone in my apartment years ago (laughs) it was great excellent yeah yeah what about you uh, I actually do not remember the first time I watched this. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Is, yeah. is that in a sense that it's kind of potentially blended together with all the other Argento and Giallo movies for you? Or is it just one of those like it's always been with you? No, <laughs> I think it was in a period of time where I was just watching a ton of stuff. Sure. And I do remember coming away from it not really liking it interesting uh it because it was like it was definitely uh first watch was too weird for me Hmm. which is funny because yeah now you know it's this this is this kind of uh it you know i i think this was i think what it was is this was probably if i had to guess my first italian horror movie yeah i think it was mine too yeah and i think there's like a you got to kind of meet these halfway to a certain extent Mm mm-hmm uh, and realize that they are, you know, wait till we get to uh, next year when we get into our video nasties. Oh, boy. Because there's a couple on there <laughs> that are like, don't make any fucking sense at all. Okay. <laughs> like, like the vibe is really cool. Yeah. But narratively, total mess. I can, I can, I can work with that. Yeah. Especially if I'm forewarned. Yeah. You know. Really violent, too. So yeah. get ready for that. All right. Um, a lot of brain squishing. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think I watched this. I probably watched this for the first time in college, if I had mm. to guess, college area. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I remember thinking it was. I think did I watch it on DVD? I probably watched it on DVD. I remember thinking it was confusing and like it didn't really click with me because I wasn't mm. really into the Italian thing yet. Sure. Um, and sometimes if you're not ready for that, it can be, it can come off as bad. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, it sort of has not, not exactly the same, but that, that kind of David Lynch thing. Yes. You know, where it's like sometimes people, the the acting is, seems so over the top and so. Right. 
strange that it can be a little off-putting and make you feel like is this just bad acting or is this on yes. purpose yeah yes yeah. definitely definitely um i think that's that's a that's an interesting hurdle in general when when mm-hmm. you're when you're watching movies and stuff because mm-hmm. if you are um not open to the idea of let's say non-traditional performances mm-hmm. those things can skew bad yeah on your first watch yeah. until you're kind of like oh i see what's going on like i have a friend of right. mine who anytime i talk about david lynch he always sends me just the clip of robert loja beating the shit out of the guy in uh lost highway yep he's like this isn't supposed to be good like this is this is bad right like this is a bad scene and i'm like i mean no it's like that's how it's supposed to be right like, i can't really explain right. it to you other than to say it's an intentional choice yeah and yeah. like out of context of the rest of the movie of course it seems ridiculous sure yeah <laughs> yes not that it seems less ridiculous in the context of that movie, but um, yeah, I think I think the Italian horror thing is is a is an interesting wall that you kind of have to get over or fence mm. maybe, and it's so interesting to me in the con- in the context of um, the video era where mm. people were renting movies and stuff because they do feel so foreign, and I don't mean that in like a bad way. Yeah, I just mean they just feel alien. Yeah. A lot of times. Yeah. Like, it, I, it, yeah. Some of it feels a little bit like you're missing something. Like, yeah. like there's a, I don't know, something either like lost in translation, like literally mm-hmm. in what the characters are saying or that there's some, some sort of cultural context or something that you're, you're missing that would make things make more sense immediately to mm-hmm. you as a viewer. And it's like, n- no, <laughs> no, they're yeah. just supposed to be this way. Yeah, and it's uh, and so it's it's so interesting to me thinking of of like going into a video store, grabbing mm-hmm. one of these Italian movies, mm-hmm. and putting it on, and just having like no idea what you're in for. <laughs> yes, you've read <clears throat> you've read the uh, the case from the movie rental place, and that's all you've read about it before. Yeah, yeah, like you grab a Lucio Fulci movie, and it's like, oh, this is this is called mm-hmm. Zombie. I guess it's about zombies, and then <laughs> it just there's a zombie fighting a shark and there's people getting their guts ripped out and it's it's all kind of like the language the the english is so weird because it's mm-hmm. like trans there's I, I know i'm going way off topic right here but <laughs> We're i am very I'm, excited I'm, to talk about this yes one. i I'm, i've been very into the italian movie the giallo movies yeah. lately since we did uh, gr- uh bird with the crystal plumage and so i've been watching a bunch of them and it's starting to bleed through into my reality um <laughs> he's seeing everything in vivid reds and yes, greens i wish and, oh god i yeah. wish <laughs> um but there was a, like there's a movie uh i think it's a sergio leone movie one of mm. his lesser ones called duck you sucker huh the other name is fistful of dynamite it's got one of those got like four or five uh. names and so the the one of the I think the story is one of the actors was American mm-hmm. and he was like, Why do you keep having me say this phrase, duck you sucker? And Leone was like, That's something people say in America, right? Like that's like a phrase. And he's like, No. <laughs> no one ever said like not in like Yeah. You know, not outside of like yeah. a black exploitation movie or something. This like, is it's like not... in did you did you watch community? Oh yeah. When uh, Chevy Chase tries to make streets ahead yes, happen, streets ahead. yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but it's the same kind of thing. So there's always this sort of like jarring translation happening right. where it's like the English isn't quite on point. Mm-hmm. Like this guy that's supposed to be from New York is this weird approximation of a New York person yeah. run through like the yeah. uh, Italian filter. It's it's like very when you, interesting when we when when translation software and, and algorithms weren't very good in the earlier internet days and you could take something that was in one language like you take something in english translate it into another language and then translate that back into english and you get like a wildly different output exactly yeah yeah that's all to say suspiria (laughs) is it's it's a it's i don't i don't want to say it's an acquired taste but like i feel like it is it's it is a it is a different experience than most movies for, yeah. for a bunch of different reasons that we'll get into. But yes. we're going to take a quick break and play the trailer. And we're going to come back and talk about it. Roses are red. Violets are blue. But 
Okay, Suspiria from 1977, directed by Dario Argento, written by Dario Argento and Daria Nicolodi, Mm. based kind of on Suspiria de Profundis by Thomas de Quincey, Mm -hmm. Uh, more specifically um, from a a section of that called Lavana and Our Ladies of Sorrow, which is where- AKA, I took way too much opium and this is what happened? Yes, basically. It's- uh, my understanding is most of the movie comes from Dari Nicolodi. Mm. And the concept of the three mothers, which they don't really get into in this movie, but the, mm-hmm. this idea of uh, the mother of size, mm-hmm. uh, Mater de Suspiria or, or whatever, comes from this uh, Thomas, yeah. Thomas de Quincey thing. Um, I don't know. I haven't read it. I don't know exactly I how much. I found it on the internet. I might try to read it. Yeah. At least that one section, but I got a lot of stuff to do. You know? <laughs> Uh, starring Jessica Harper, Stefania Cassini, Joan Bennett, Barbara Mag- Magnolfi, the child killer from Deep Red, plays the little blonde kid. Oh. The, yeah, the stabby kid from the Deep Red. Nice. Uh, the great Udo Kier, or at least at least his face, if not his voice, <laughs> and a 90-year-old former prostitute that R- Argento reportedly found on the streets of Rome as Helena Marcos. Wow. Amanda. What happens in Suspiria? Susie travels to Germany to attend ballet school. When she arrives late on a stormy night, no one lets her in. And she sees Pat, another student, fleeing from the school. Pat Hingle, not the actor who plays Commissioner Gordon (laughs) in the Tim Burton Batman movie. The character Pat Hingle. Yes, who is a girl. Yes. Uh, When Pat reaches her apartment, she is murdered. The next day, Susie is admitted to her new school, but has dif- a difficult time settling in. She hears noises and often feels ill. As more people die, Susie uncovers the terrifying secret of the place. That's pr- yeah, that's. <laughs> it's weirdly detailed about yeah. the first like thirty minutes mm-hmm. of the movie, and then it's just like, and secrets ensue, and it's like. Oh. It's strange because this is definitely one where someone could just throw up their hands and go, I don't know. A girl from America goes to a dance school in Germany where she finds out that there is a dark secret. Yeah. Or some shit. Yeah. A series of mysterious deaths. Yeah. This reads like someone who wants to tell somebody about the opening scene of this movie. (laughs) It's it's like, okay, no, I promise. This movie is really cool. Okay, look, there's this girl, Susie, and she's from New York, Mm -hmm. but she goes to Germany because she's going to ballet school, Mm -hmm. and the ballet school's like really cool. Sure. It's all of that. Listen, we got to fit this on the back of a box here, buddy. Come on. (laughs) Well, Clay, some things you'll find in Suspiria include Mm -hmm. a light drizzle of maggots. Yes. I so the maggot thing. <laughs> there's we're gonna we're gonna get into this a lot, and I think there's gonna be a lot of questions, at least from me, where I go, what exactly is that supposed to be? And I'm gonna go, it's symbolic, Clay. Yeah, but like as far as the maggots go, symbolism. Why did they store that food in the attic? Like what? There's there's a certain. Anyway, moving. On. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. Hmm. A school of dance and the occult yes. sciences. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I really like that scene. I specifically love that phrasing because Udo Kier tosses that off as, you know, this Helena Marcos person started, yes. you know, a school of dance and occult sciences, as you do. Right. Like, but he always pronounces it as occult. The occult. It drives me insane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, surprise Oktoberfest. Yeah. 
where they slap each other around a bunch. <laughs> They're not actually slapping each no, other, but it's, no, it's, it's a symbolic, dance to symbolic make, slapping. Symbolic slapping, yes. like symbolic maggots. Um, Making each other pay for what happened 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Puke crystals. Puke crystals. I, Just it's a not crystal really... that you can flash in someone's face. Yeah, she technically doesn't puke, but she does. She seems like she might want to. You know, I identify with that sequence a lot more. Puke crystals? Yeah, the older that I get. Because I feel like I'm at <laughs> a point where if I like catch a glint of light off of something, it'll just ruin my whole fucking day. Where I'll just be like, my whole equilibrium gets thrown off and I'm like, I just, I just gotta. Hey man, as someone who literally had benign <clears throat> positional vertigo for yeah. like six weeks a few years back, I feel ya. I was gonna say, that th- that crystal thing is like a literal is uh, or yes. a literalization of what, what was happening with you. Yeah. If somebody had flashed that in my eyes and I had turned my head too fast, I would have fallen over. So... <laughs> I was Lucille too for a brief period of time. <laughs> uh, and an actual bird with crystal plumage. I have to feel like that's got to be on purpose, right? <laughs> it's it's kind I can't tell if I love it or mm-hmm. if it really makes me want to scream. <laughs> where I'm like, why didn't you name this movie The Bird with the Crystal Plumage? Cuz she finds a bird with the crystal plumage and kills a woman with yeah, it. Yeah, it's it makes she defeats only, a witch with it. It would be only a slightly more appropriate title for this one. Yes. Where at least it, you know, it's not false advertising. Right. Yes. The Chris, the plumage is literally crystal. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, it has to be on purpose. It, it's definitely on purpose. So given that, I probably love it. Yeah. Uh, so yes, this is Dario Argento's movie he did right after Deep Red. Uh, he wrote it with Dari Nicolodi, who was his... I don't know if they were married or if it mm. was... I know they were together. And uh, she's the female lead from Deep Red. Oh. And uh, they worked together. They wrote a bunch of stuff mm. to get, I think, I'm pretty sure. And it's one of those things where I believe the kind of popular conception or... Not uh, conception is the right word. But the popular belief is kind of mm. like once they split up, mm. he wasn't doing quite as good work so like she yeah. was bringing a lot more to the table with him than i yeah. think a lot of people were giving her credit for kind of like a deborah hill john Carpenter i was just situation. thinking the same thing yeah <clears throat> and uh most of the basis of this story seems to come from her hmm. because she had a uh this was he uh, argento was inspired to make this film by stories that nicolodi's uh by stories of Nickelodeon's grandmother who claimed to have fled from a german music academy because witchcraft was being secretly practiced there Awesome. And she, uh, Nickelodeon had also... I feel the sudden need to pick up an instrument <laughs> and move to Germany. <laughs> well, I was going to say, like, a, a, a school of dance in the occult. I mean, yes, that feel, I feel like... a school of music and magic. Yeah, that seems like it would be right up your alley. Absolutely. And oh, I guess... Yeah, dance in the occult. I guess I used to do that. <laughs> she also, I guess, uh, had a nightmare that involved an invisible witch and an exploding panther, both of which happen what? at the end of this. So I think... a. There's definitely a lot of her influence on this. That's amazing. Um, and it's 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 the first blending of the giallo style with uh, the supernatural mm-hmm. that he really does. And I guess it's very contested whether or not this counts as a giallo film. Interesting. I feel like, in my very uneducated opinion, I feel like it should because it kind of hits all the beats. It's just got like witches in it and stuff. Yeah, but there's a killer, a killer who you don't know. Mm-hmm. A lot of first person killer point of view. Yep. it's a bit of a mystery. Yep. The thing that kind of stands out to me right away is that even though he's kind of shifting into this more uh, supernatural stuff, mm-hmm. the core theme that we've seen across three of these movies that, of his that we've done still remains, which is this idea that. There is some sort of battle with your own perception. Yes. To kind of like do the uh, enhance, yeah. <laughs> enhance, but with yes. your own mind. Yes. Where it the first uh, deep red, it was seeing the killer in the reflection and not realizing he had picked up that information. Yep. Same in Crystal Plumage, where he's he realizes that he saw that the killer was this woman. Yeah. But he has to unlock this memory or right. whatever. Right. Right. Something something in his in his mind when he recalls the memory isn't clear enough. Yeah. Yeah. And in this one, it's Susie hearing the secret. 
yep. said through distortion. Mm-hmm. It's, it's now this time it's like a uh, it's like a cop movie. Yeah, where they bring him the the <laughs> audio file and it's like I think I can clean this up. Yeah. Like, anyway. Yeah. But it's it's really interesting that he's still playing with this same theme across all three of these movies. Yeah, sort of like the unreliability and the fallibility of human perception. Yeah. yeah. Of like what what you see versus what you later recall, mm-hmm. which I think is a really interesting question to sort of play with because it goes into less so in his movies, but it definitely kind of tiptoes towards like the unreliable narrator mm. thing where it, it's sort of like you can't trust what your protagonist is saying, not because they're willfully lying all the time, but just because they're human and they're fallible. Sure. Which just, yeah, I always find that stuff more interesting than it just being like, you know, well, it's really obvious, you know, all she'd need to do is walk out the door and see that it's Clay who's here to kill her. Right. Or whatever. Yeah. Always. Always. Always is. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's. Um, I find it to be a really interesting angle on the sort of, uh, 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 mystery that he likes to get into because mm-hmm. I do think you know we had kind of talked about this I think a bit off air before we recorded <laughs> the last episode but I, I had been watching a, a number of these Giallo movies yeah and one of the hallmarks of these movies is the late movie reveal mm. of who the killer is that is yes. so insane Yes. That there is no way you could have possibly guessed it, but that's like part of the fun. I think we have talked a little bit about this, I think, when we did Bird with Crystal with the Crystal Plumage, because we were saying how in that movie there was no way as an audience person that you could have with the clues given right. figured it out. Like you could guess it, but right. you couldn't have pinpointed like, oh wait, because of this moment and this moment it has to be this person. Right. Whereas, at least in Deep Red, if you were quick enough to catch that, yes. they do show her reflected in that mirror. Yep. So if you're on your toes enough and you catch her and you say, oh, wait a minute, who is that weird lady? And then you see her pop up later in the movie, you could ostensibly figure it out. Yeah. I think the thing I love about this movie is that you don't have to. Oh, yeah. It like, matter. yeah. <laughs> like,. <laughs> This... You don't know exactly what's going on and maybe you don't like you don't know who murders who who exactly murders Pat and then you don't know who exactly murders Sarah right. until the end of the movie but you know it's someone in the school you know it's one of the instructors and then you know there's supernatural shit going on so right. it, then it becomes less about this like almost Sherlock Holmes exercise in, in like kind of noirish thing. And, mm-hmm. and it just kind of lets the supernatural aspects of the movie carry some of the stuff that would otherwise be like, feel like a plot hole or feel a little bit like that doesn't make any sense. Like you can just be like, well, I mean, but in this movie, witches are real. Right. So yeah, yeah don't worry about it. Just like keep going. And the thing that's so fascinating about that, the the choice to to do this sort of perceptual uh, uh, awakening thing that he does, is it kind of gets around this idea that you you the viewer can't solve the the thing mm-hmm. by in the body of the movie giving the main character the main character has the information, mm-hmm. they just don't know they have the information, mm-hmm. which is really interesting because it's like well I guess yeah in the con in the context it's like we can't solve it because we don't know what the what's going on but they actually do have the information in their brain, you know they just have to unlock it sort of, mm-hmm. and in and in this film in particular. That information doesn't really, like, there's no big reveal of who the killer is in this the way that they, you would in Deep Red or in, in Bird of the Crystal Plumage. Right. She never has a moment where she goes, oh, it was you. Right. Yeah. And even at the end of the movie, I'm not even sure why they're doing this. <laughs> I have I have some thoughts, which we can get into. But sure. uh, um, what I think is funny about this, and it's it's almost the, it's almost the, the death of the momentum in this movie, I think, mm. where usually you've got Deep Red or Crystal Burb with Crystal Blue, but you get your big final act, like in the the body of the last scene, mm-hmm. you get your killer explaining the insane reason that they're doing this. Mm-hmm. In this movie, the killer doesn't explain it. 
you have like a five minute scene where Udo Kier just tells you everything there is to know about witches. Yep. And the occult. Sorry, the occult. Yes, please say it correctly. <laughs> and essentially lays out what's happening. Getting that out of the way. And so you mm-hmm. can go into the end of this movie and just lean into the craziness of it mm-hmm. and not really worry about having to explain a bunch of shit, even though they right. do a little bit when Helena Mark, when they start, I feel like it, I don't know if it was a studio note or something, but at the end when she's like, you want to kill Helena Marcos? Like, okay, we have to make it clear who this is. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's 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 inter- interesting how they do it that way and kind of get that stuff out of the way and just let yeah. you just continue to marinate in this stuff because the whole movie is not, it's not, it's not a plot based movie. Right. It's a big, it's meant to be a fairy tale, really. Yeah, yeah. And it's this experience, but at some point they got to tell you what's happening. And so they go, all right, we're going to have the only two men in the movie show up, and uh, (laughs) basically, and explain what's going on, and then get back into the crazy shit and let you just ride into the finale. We're going to give you two male doctors to tell you what's happening. That's honestly my favorite part of that scene is Udo Kier has a very deep well of knowledge about this, but mm-hmm. then he's like, let me get the other guy that I know who knows about yes. this stuff to tell you more. Yes. And then he he, sa- he says, like, tell her something about the mysterious. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which goes back to that kind of thing we were saying about, like, like feeling like everything's being put through a translation filter and yes. then put back into English. Tell her um. something about the mysterious. Oh, well, you know, they don't actually know how anesthesia works. Yes. <laughs> That's not what I meant, Doctor. Why do we sleep? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows. No, and I like, uh, like, you were saying that this, this movie is kind of a fairy tale. And I really like that about this movie. So mm-hmm. it, it was, it's interesting because this was kind of my first, this was, I think, my first, the first movie I saw in this kind of genre so i was more surprised when then like you and i watched deep red and there was no supernatural stuff me too i thought that first of all i think this is probably most people's yeah first (laughs) first and maybe only yeah um and when i started i think one of the things that turned me off to the giallo genre originally Mm -hmm. was i i went in being like oh shit dario argento suspiria I really yep. like Inferno. Inferno is basically like in, on equal footing as far as like content as this movie. Okay. And I'm like, great. I, that's This is what Giallo is? Awesome. Mm-hmm. And then you get into these other movies and it's just like a dry murder mystery. <laughs> doesn't right. have to be dry, but. No, no, no. But I, yeah, I see what you're saying. And like, like kind of like we were talking before with um, Crystal Plumage. When you and, and other movies, I think as well that we've covered, when you introduce this murder mystery element and then you introduce the cop plot, mm-hmm. it sort of encourages you as a viewer to try to figure things out. Right. And by avoiding, like, by having the supernatural element in this movie and not having a cop plot, it just it just skips that. Right. It's like you yeah. don't need to try to piece this together because what's happening here isn't following real world logic. Right. It is following fairy tale logic. Yes. Yeah. Um, which I really liked. Like, there were there were a couple things I got real um, English major nerdy about <laughs> watching this. Like, you do you like? I didn't know the building was called the Whale House. Yes, it's it's yeah. based on a real building. Yeah, the, the design, at least the exterior. I don't know. Yeah, about I think the exterior. the exterior shots are of the real building. No, it's a no, set. it's a set. But it okay. is built to look like that house. Yes. Yeah, but uh, like I was trying to read something, and it was sort of kind of. Like, well, it's suspected that this house was called the Whale House because of a connection with the story of Jonah and the Whale. <laughs> sure. Okay. Which, like, I don't know <laughs> if that's true of the building, obviously. Yeah. But if that's something kind of floating around out there, that's an interesting little tidbit. Because once she goes into that house, she is being kind of swallowed by a beast. And mm-hmm. she has to, like, fight her way back out, which is kind of the Jonah and the Whale story. Yeah. Like yeah, I thought I was like, that's interesting. I don't know if the if the text fully supports that analysis. <laughs> I'm Sorry, throw I you out of the room. Sorry, I don't think I nailed the phrase. But <laughs> you didn't, but you were close. Close enough. He's trying to mimic my uh my advisor from my my grad degree days. <laughs> um, yeah, mm. I, you know, it's I I think it's it's so it you watching Deep Red 
before this. I'm glad we watched Deep Red before this because mm-hmm. you can see him leaning in this direction because Deep yes. Red has like less, not so much a fairy tale, but it's very, got a lot of dream logic to it. Yeah. Um, it feels like it has almost like like a little bit of like a folklore mm-hmm. vibe to it or like 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 it's it's kind of an allegory. Do you know what I mean? Where mm-hmm. it's this sort of like the in deep red the, the it's the story of the the wife and mother going crazy and killing the husband in front right. of the little boy right. and then going from there and it's this this sort of like it's based on this story that feels very like urban legendy. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And then this one kind of moves even further down that road. Yeah. And yeah. as far as the, the imagery and the way that he's shooting these things, it, it's very it, uh, deep red is kind of dipping its toe in the surreal quite a bit. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I think it's I think you can kind of see him getting bored. If mm. not, not maybe not bored, but let's just say bored with <laughs> with the Jalo genre. Mm. And so he's pushing it in a different direction that it hasn't gone in yeah which it's actually like i i think the sweet spot for me as much as i you know if you want to say that this is not officially a jala movie sure whatever mm-hmm. but deep red is yes and the sweet spot for me i think is that sort of jalo where it's murder mystery sure yeah but it's got some surre- surrealism baked into it sure and there's a little bit of implied supernatural stuff going on like yeah. I just watched one called the Red Queen Kill seven times mm, you which I really that, yeah. liked which has a an underlying ghost story attached to it mm. even though it doesn't end up being actually supernatural but there's there's enough weirdness hooked into that concept mm-hmm. that makes it a lot more interesting than just like a standard kind of like you know slasher who done it? Yeah, because it's it's got to get kind of frustrating when, you know, if 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 we're even partially right <laughs> in in the way we interpret these movies, where kind of what he's going for is more of like a set of images or a feeling mm. or a vibe, whatever, however you want to call it, less so than like a strictly logical linear narrative. Mm. It's got to get really exhausting if people are coming, like, kind of like, well, that doesn't make sense. If you have it, this, oh, sure. this, and this, yeah. it's like, okay, how do you just do away with, like, the, that almost, that that kind of trying trying to connect the dots almost becomes like a distraction, I think, yeah. in a lot of ways. Well, you know, like we said in B- G- Bird with the Crystal Plumage, it feels like a movie made entirely out of tropes yeah. at the sacrifice of a story. And it works because, like, he specifically, all three of these movies feel like they are almost like personal nightmare movies. Like yeah. I, I feel like these are a lot more personal movies as far as the imagery that he's presenting and the way he's doing it mm-hmm. than a lot of these giallos tend to be, which is just like, all right, this is the story that we're going to yes, tell. We're going to stab gonna this the woman. Here. Yeah, <laughs> like I, I watched. I've run the gamut. Yeah. So I've watched. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you've been deep in this I for a few weeks now. Mario Bava's The Evil Eye, which is mm-hmm. known as the first Giallo, <coughs> which was very fun, black and white. John Saxon, good movie, mm-hmm. and it's a, it's a little bit more. It's more of a straight kind of murder mystery kind of thing. Okay. Um, I also watched The Red Queen Kill Seven Times, which was kind of in the middle, mm-hmm. and then I also ra- watched Lucio Fulci's The New York Ripper, which is the other end of this stuff as far as uh, movies that are descendants of Argento, mm. which is one of the sleaziest movies I've watched in a long time. <laughs> and uh, Fulci has a has a um, reputation as a gore hound. Like, mm. that's, you think, most people think Fulci, it's just like, oh, that, that's like the goriest movie you're going to find in the 70s. Got it. And so he brought that sensibility to the New York Ripper, which uh, I found very amusing because there was the first, this first, one of the first kills. Mm-hmm. They do the thing where like the killer goes at the woman and the woman screams and they kind of like mm-hmm. cut to an exterior shot of New York. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, wow, that was really restrained for him. Mm-hmm. Then the next shot, they cut back to a full <laughs> close up of him like sawing up her torso <laughs> oh and her god. guts falling out. And I was like, there it oh is. Oh my God. That's the one. There it is. Um, and we do get a little bit. You know, not exactly, not to that level, but like this movie's not without its gore. No, and I wanted to talk about that because 
this is, I mean, the, the, the most famous thing from this movie mm-hmm. is the first 20 minutes. Yep. Uh, which I, apparently, I believe on the poster, the tagline was, the only thing scarier than the first 20 minutes is the next 50 or something. <laughs> Which is pretty good, but also it's pretty stupid. I was going to say, it's a terrible, terrible way to advertise your movie. <laughs> yeah. And so you have this great uh, opening, another Stranger in a Strange Land film yep. from yep. Argento about an American. Yes. Actually an American this time. Yes. Uh, coming to Europe yep. and kind of entering into this. It's really strange because he's a, ta- like, did he have this experience? Did he like go to America and have the, because it's, it's so strange that it's always American mm-hmm. coming to Somewhere in Europe, Mm -hmm. being out of their depth, Mm -hmm. and like it feels like, I mean, it feels like an a pretty setup that works every time. But it also he does it so often, it feels like did this like happen to him or something? I wonder. I mean, I I I do. I do want I I wonder if there's like a personal connection or if it's just a matter of it's too good of a setup to resist. Right. Do you know what I mean? And and I'm and I'm sure like. You're much more likely as an Italian, I think, to encounter an American who's going to very vocally let you know that they're an American mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> rather than being an American and having somebody who's from Italy come and be like, no, I live here now. Yeah. It's like we don't get as much of, of that. Yeah. I will say the other thing that kind of might disqualify this from being a giallo is mm-hmm. generally the the main character views the murder in question, which does not happen in this one. Right. She hears uh, about right. many of the murders. If the main character of Suspiria had mm. been the woman who gets the window dropped on her at the, at the end of the first oh. sequence, then it would maybe be closer to Giallo. But anyway. Interesting. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, where she had just seen it happen. Yeah, but no, I, I, I love even the very begin, beginning, beginning of this movie, like literally as it starts, there's the voiceover. Yeah, That's very like, fairy tale like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I I don't think it quite starts with the cliche once upon a time, but I think it, it is may very as well. much. Yeah. yeah, I think it's like one day Susie whatever decided. Yep. <laughs> it's like this very paternal sounding man's voice. And then I love seeing her come through the airport. Mm-hmm. Because as somebody who's traveled a lot, like I can tell you in most countries, especially like European countries and American North American countries airports are airports you know they 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 kind of all look the same yeah like there's there are these weird liminal spaces where everything is sort of like made to be generic and familiar no matter how different a place you come from Mm -hmm. and so they're kind of like I think a lot of people think they're without personality which I think is often true but they can also be very comforting places Mm. Because leaving from JFK in New York and landing in the airport outside of, you know, like Munich or whatever, you kind of feel like you're just walking off the plane into the same place. Sure. It's not until you physically leave the airport that you really realize like, oh, wait, I'm somewhere really different. Mm. And so you have this moment of her kind of like, you never see her in the United States. You never see her on the plane. Mm. You just see her in this space that's essentially just like an empty entryway into another world. Yeah. And I think that's a really smart place to start it. You know, don't not starting with her driving up to the school. Right. But also not starting with her in New York, having her parents drop her off at the airport. Right. You know? Yes. Yeah. I think it, it, it kind of emphasizes that fairy tale feeling of like a young woman walking through the woods by herself well he also he also really leans into what you're talking about i think because when she goes to as she gets closer to the door Mm -hmm. they start cutting in the goblin music yes every time they cut to the (laughs) shot of the door yes and then as she goes through the door they do this extreme close-up on the gears of the door Mm -hmm. almost like you know the the drawbridge of a castle going you know opening this door opening her into this literal storm of of, yes. of darkness and stuff yeah and it's it's very like gothic horror for a minute and yeah. everything it's like lightning crashing you know and, and thunder crashing and wind and rain and she's trying desperately to get a cab and everyone's ignoring her like yeah yeah it's it's this great opening scene and then even the taxi ride of clearly like even like her cabbie's not behaving the way she expects a cabbie to mm-hmm. like he didn't get out to help her with her bags he's not 
helpful about like trying to get her like he he keeps saying where are you going and she keeps saying it and he's like he doesn't understand but he's also not trying to help her about it right and then she tries to make conversation he clearly doesn't want to talk to her like it's very it's a very smart way of very quickly emphasizing what a fish out of water she really is Mm -hmm. and then they drive away from the airport through like the spookiest woods i believe it's the Known as the Black Forest, I think. Oh, really? I think so. Yeah. Oh, that's so metal. Yeah. <laughs> There's posters for it in the airport. There's she's just, as she's walking oh towards the door. Oh my god! Really? That say Black the Black Forest. Visit the Black Forest. Oh, I missed that. I'm gonna have to look for that again. <laughs> but yeah, they they drive her through the forest yeah. like she's going to Dracula's castle or something. Yeah, yeah. Or she's like Little Red Riding Hood. Right. Yeah. And uh, when she gets to the, she gets to the school, which is this amazing set design based on this whale house Mm -hmm. that feels like a fairy tale castle yeah and you know you get your it's the closest thing in the movie to seeing the murder where she sees uh pat hingle yes (laughs) commissioner gordon (laughs) um commissioner gordon in a tutu running out in uh, in distress, talking to someone just inside the door. Yes, and then she runs off, and then the movie the movie switches to follow Pat. Yeah, it's such an interesting move because I I feel like even you know I don't want to speak like oh audiences in the seventies would have been so put off by that. <laughs> I think audiences now are kind of put off by that. Mm. You know, where you're you're introduced and you kind of clearly have this very relatable protagonist and then to just like that quickly into a movie just kind of leave her behind right and follow this other character it's it's like very disorienting in a way that i think works really well yeah yeah it's not quite psycho not quite scream no but it's got the same kind of vibe where it's like all right we're why are we following this woman now right right it kind of sets you up to know something's gonna happen but you don't know what right i bet whoever was watching this movie did not plan on what was about to happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, Pat goes to this, uh, I guess it must be a friend's house, apartment or something. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. And again, it's this gorgeously designed, very kind of unreal seeming yeah. art deco apartment with this beautiful multicolored skylight. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're just like sitting in this, the the, the colors and the design yeah. And the uh, it's it's all beautiful but it's all very off-putting cuz it's it's it is really unlike anything yeah. else I've ever really seen. Yeah, it almost reminds me of those um like movies or or like paintings or whatever where the the everything's done on purpose that the proportions are off. Oh sure. To make you feel like it's a little uncanny. Like a, like a mad fold-in. Like like a what? Mad magazine fold in. Oh <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is that? Um I was actually thinking about the the sort of the benign version of this is uh Disney World. Oh sure, yeah. Where oh it's it, very Disney. It, it, it's yeah. yeah. Where everything like the perspective is changed so that everything looks bigger than it is. Sure. Yeah. But I feel like force perspective type stuff. Yeah, yeah. but I feel like this movie kind of does the opposite. Whereas when you're in Disney you, you go to Disneyland or Disney World your your the way you walk in and the way everything is situated makes the buildings along the little main street look taller Mm -hmm. like they're not even aren't they like not even fully two-story but some of them look like like they're three yes i think so um and then the the castle you know cinderella's castle looks enormous but as you get closer you realize that it's like a one-eighth scale or something like that um this one's different because even in this this crazy art deco and I feel like this carries forward into other sets in the movie as well. The doorways are huge. Yes. Um, so one of the things that he did was the doors specifically, all the, mm-hmm. the doorknobs are up like at shoulder height. Oh. Specifically so they would have to like kids because oh. it would seem more like children having to reach up and turn the knob. Which is very fairy tale. Right. Yeah. Apparently, he originally wanted to do this movie with 12-year-olds. And they, the studio said, we can't let you make a movie that's this violent with 12-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> and so he scaled it up wow. to 20. He scaled it up to 20, and then he was like, all right, what can I do to wow. bring that fa- fairy tale type 
feeling back and so the doors are all oversized i don't think i would like this movie as much if it was like and now this 12 year old girl gets hanged (laughs) from the rooftops yeah well we'll revisit that when we if we watch phenomena which is a later movie of his but uh um it's yeah he's definitely designing things a little bit larger yeah to make these girls seem smaller and and these girls are already they're they're you know they're young women but they're very waifish. Yes. You yeah. know, they're 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 ballerinas. Yeah. They're very petite. They're very thin. Yeah. Yeah. And so you get Pat in this beautiful Art Deco place with this crazy lighting and stuff going mm-hmm. on. And then all of a sudden you're thrown right into the deep end of like disembodied eyes and hands yeah. and smashing through windows and shit. Yeah. Even the way that like the way that this she's killed is so it's it's so unique in its uh is surreality a word yeah you know what i mean yeah like the the, the thing yeah (laughs) sure um the thing like the the shot that actually there's two shots in this that always stand out to me as as Mm -hmm. the ones that just kind of like take me aback i wonder if i can guess one first one (laughs) is when they do the outside the window shot Mm -hmm. of her face just like smushed up against the glass. Yes. And it's like distorting her face in yep. like a really, you know, abstract sort of gr- you yeah. know, grimace. Yeah. Before, because he loves to do this, her face just smashes through the window. Yes. There's lots of smashing, sma- girls smashing their body parts through windows. Argento loves putting a lady's face through a window. I'm not yeah. really sure why, but. Yeah. Something probably about mirrors and vanity. And I'm sure. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Um, and the second one is after they get after she's tied up and she's mm-hmm. laying down on the on the big pane of glass mm. her head breaks through yes. and you get this shot of like of just the like the crown of her head and her hair mm-hmm. broken through the glass yes and like the light coming up on her and you know she's yep. got this awful like scream on her face and it's an it's an amazing image yeah and she she looks almost like waxen yeah like she looks like a doll yeah. in that moment yeah and i i feel like it's a really haunting image it's like also it will really s- kind of stick in your mind once you've seen it because there's something it, it's like in bet- in this moment where you've watched her kind of very very close up get stabbed a lot that's the other thing is like with is as as supernatural as the things that are happening are there it's also very much like she's getting stabbed with a knife yeah. by a goblin arm yeah. but she's still getting <laughs> stabbed with a knife and the way that she gets stabbed Mm -hmm. is so visceral yeah i'm not really sure why but there's something about the way that they shoot it and the way she reacts where it's just it's so it doesn't feel staged it it, yeah it doesn't feel theatrical it just very much feels like someone deliberately getting just stabbed in the chest yeah i'm not i can't really describe why it it feels the way it does but it's interesting because in my head I, i i keep comparing it to um the beginning of halloween Mm-hmm. When little little Michael Myers kills his sister Judith, mm-hmm. like that, you don't see as many of the actual stabbing strikes, and the way she reacts, her 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 sounds of pain almost sound like moans. Mm. Like y- y- you know what I mean? Like where it's very like oh, oh mm-hmm. you know, it's like not. I don't know. It just doesn't ever feel realistic to me. And then you have like in this one. When she gets stabbed, she makes noises like she's being punched in the stomach. Right. Which yeah. feels a lot more visceral to me. Yeah. Um, and then there's that <laughs> fucking wild moment where it's like the, the <laughs> he's like stabbed out her ribs, I guess, yes. and just like stabs her <laughs> directly in the exposed I, heart. I do I do really appreciate <laughs> I do so appreciate him going so far in the other direction yes. where he's like, Not only am I going to show this person getting stabbed. I'm going to show a close-up of her exposed, still beating heart that yes. I am then going to stab with a knife. Yes, and then you can watch some blood come out <laughs> yeah, of it. Yeah, it's fuck it's it's wild. Yeah, it's insane. It's a crazy person thing to do. And it's, it's like just yeah. It's it's nuts. It's disturbing. I think honestly, I think the first time I watched this, I think I this opening scene disturbed me more than anything else. I think yeah. that might have been what put me off this movie for a bit. Yeah. Because I was like, that was more intense than I was ready for. Right. Um, right, because she gets very brutalized, and then, like we were saying, she kind of falls back, and her head goes through the stained glass first, mm-hmm. 
and it sort of she's her body kind of rests there for a moment and then when the whole window collapses beneath her she falls through and and she's had a cord wrapped around her body and it kind of slides up and nooses around her neck right yeah and yeah then there's this very like it like pans over her down to the floor to show you that her friend has also been killed in in a quicker but equally artistically beautiful way because the (laughs) graphically violent and beautiful way right because the the multicolored glass so the floor is black and white it's almost like like a larger version of the twin peaks black Mm -hmm. and white kind of thing and the glass that fell down and killed her friend is this multicolored, you know, uh, primary colored glass. And when they show her friend dead on the ground, mm-hmm. if you like pause that shot, you can look and see how very specifically the colored glass is laid out mm. to like contrast and stand out from the floor. Wow. It's like it's definitely all totally considered as far as like he's he's making a painting essentially yeah, yeah. Out of it's the, a composed the, yes moment yeah and it's uh <clears throat> that's the kind of thing that i feel like you know we, we talked about this a bit like probably in one of the other two about how uh some of these movies take the wrong message or the, yes. take the wrong things <laughs> from yes. the popular things you know mm-hmm. um and i think you know when you get into something like new york ripper or the stuff that fulci was doing He's going way over the top with the gore. Yeah. But he's like when Argento does it here, it's it's almost oddly more tasteful because it, mm. it does feel like it is all part of an artistic painting instead yeah. of just like want to see what this girl's guts look like. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. It feels I will say like, it, you know, there's gore in this movie, but I do feel like it's used fairly sparingly. You know, yeah. like we don't get a ton of other really explicit gore. It's sparing. It's you sparingly, but mm. it's very effective. Yes. Like when uh, Sarah falls into the. <laughs> oh, my God. The like pit of the, razor wire on the which roof. Which is like. <laughs> it's, it's so that's such a nightmare. Yes. Idea. Yep. And it's, it's like, like an exploding like, panther. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also kind of hilarious because the way that they shoot that scene she's standing on this box looking at this door yeah. across the, the way yeah and they're not showing what's underneath she's, she's not showing what's underneath her mm-hmm. and there's no indication that she realizes there's a room full of razor wire in front right. of her until she jumps and the camera tilts down yep and you see the giant pit of razor wire that yep. she falls into and so she's screaming into immediately even though she's there <laughs> and could see it with her eyes she doesn't see it until the camera right. shows it. Right. And it's it's hilarious, but it's also, it's so interesting. Well, it's very dream logic. Oh, definitely, Like, that's yeah. absolutely something that would happen to you in a dream or a nightmare. Yeah. Is, like, you you go into a room and you don't, re- like, you, you walk right in and you don't realize it, but the whole thing is melting and now you're you're being sunk sunk into the floor. Right. And, and you like, know, you've, get, you've got this moment where she's, wriggling in this wire which is bad enough yeah. but then when the the killer comes in and even though it's a witch still uses a straight razor for some reason um, old habits die hard yeah when the killer kills her mm-hmm. cuts her neck they do this close up to what i have to imagine was like somebody cutting a piece of pork or something yeah because it is a realistic looking cut yes and it's it's there's no blood right but the way the but skin and stuff splits parting it's yeah. really disturbing yeah it's gross it's, it's really fucking gross but like that's that kind of stuff is the moments that he uses those those kinds of images in this movie are clearly carefully chosen right they're not just like a gore fest throughout like right. even even when the um so later in the movie after you know Pat has 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 died and Susie's moved into the into the school the pianist the mm-hmm. blind man who's the, who's the pianist whose dog bites <laughs> the creepy little boy right um it, it, some something we find out later it was witches <clears throat> Causes this other very wa- very well behaved, otherwise well behaved guide dog mm-hmm. to turn on his owner and kill him, mm-hmm. and you see sort of like the dog latching onto his throat and him kind of like trying to scream, but it looks pretty 
I mean, at least to me, it looked pretty obviously like a puppet oh, yeah, in those yeah. moments. But then the camera angle switches and you don't see his face, but you see the dog just clearly going to town on just like a yeah. haunch of meat. And that dog is so happy because he's like, this is the best job ever. I yep. get to eat this meat. <laughs> what did you what did you think of that sequence? Because I yeah. that's the one sequence in this movie that I've never really cared for because I don't feel like it totally works. Like the idea of him walking through this big empty open courtyard with just, I mean, it's kind of a cool dreamy sort of shot. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't really find it particularly scary. I'm not really sure why they kill him. Yeah. And so I think it's a revenge thing. I think because so at the school, we were saying there's like, there's, there's the instructors, there's Miss Tanner, who's mm -hmm. kind of the second in command of everything kind of dealing with all the girls on, on you know in classes and whatever mm -hmm. and then there's the what is she the assistant direct directoress or something yeah, they something call like her that, yeah. um she's essentially like i think she's the assistant principal because i think helena marcos is the real principal mm -hmm. um who's madame blanche and madame blanche has a has a nephew is it supposed to be her nephew the creepy little boy yeah uh I think so. He's. A, I thought he was. He's. Is he not related to the the cook woman? I don't think so. The woman I, with the puke crystal. I don't think so. I don't think so. I th no. I think he's Madame Blanche's nephew or or sure. something. Okay. Um, I kind of wonder if he isn't supposed to be like a familiar and not oh. a, not a real child at all. Do you know what I he mean? He does seem like a bit of an energy vampire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a young Colin Robinson, if yes. you will. Um, but the dog bites him. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's purely just they they kill the pianist out of retaliation mm -hmm. for the dog biting Albert. And probably because it, it there was too long without a kill in the movie. So I think that was part of it, too. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. The, the, the one thing that that scene did that <laughs> if you don't care for that scene, I could it, it's like a little painful, but it did sort of emphasize other moments throughout the movie where they it, this movie really makes you sit with things oh yeah, yeah. like it takes its time mm -hmm. with everything it's showing you and everything that happens like he doesn't just walk across that plaza and then the dog turns on him and attacks well that's they stand there for a long yeah. time <laughs> that's the one thing that i do think works about it mm -hmm. is i don't think anybody's expecting that dog to turn on him right and so even, i keep expecting something to come and attack the dog yeah even yeah. when we were watching it the other night I forgot that that happened. So I'm watching the scene I'm like, yeah, I don't really, you know, it makes it look like there's might be something in the up in the building or whatever. Right. And then when the dog goes out, I'm like, oh, shit. Like, you're not yeah. expecting that dog to go at him. Yeah. I was sitting there going like, oh, no, this is when the dog dies. I don't want to see the dog die. I hate it when the dog dies. I don't want the dog to get hurt. And then the dog is like, ah, <laughs> I was like, oh, OK. He gets out of there scot free. That's He's fine. fine. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah um, that's the only scene. How do you feel about the big exposition dump because it does i've always felt like where it, she goes and talks to the men yes <laughs> i've always felt like it does kind of grind things to a halt a bit because it does the way first of all it's not really that interesting to look at because it's just no. a couple people sitting on a park bench <laughs> like at a convention center i was gonna say what is it the the sixth meeting on new studies in psychiatry and psychology yes 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 the sixth meeting clay and it it feels a bit like one of those um old movies they would show to kids about like sex ad or something <laughs> because she's always like so what what do witches do yeah. well Susie. right exactly let me tell you that's so interesting. How does one become a witch? Yeah. You know, like, and so it's like, it's, I, I don't guess, really know anything about it. I guess it's interesting because they are, like, the lore is pretty interesting. Like, the idea of the witch starting the school is kind of fun. But yeah. it's just such a, you know, one guy talking to her about stuff who then gets another guy to come over and talk to her about stuff. And it's, I don't know. I feel like, you, yeah. I, I don't really think you need it. I mean, it's. I don't think you need it either. I think you could have, if if you wanted to include some of that kind of cool, like, oh, she was, uh, you know, Helena Marcos. She came from another country and she was a witch and she had powers. Like, I feel like there's other ways you could have done that. Like, mm -hmm. like 
inside of the school. I so that's the thing. You know, yeah. like girls girls whispering in the locker room to one another saying yeah. like, "Oh, I heard the directoress is really Elena Marcos. Like what if it's true? What if she is a witch?" I'm I'm surprised that they let that they get her away from the school. Yeah. Because once she's there, like spe- very specifically in the story, mm-hmm. part of the thing is she doesn't want to stay at the school and they're like, "Yeah. No, you're going to stay at the school." And then <laughs> right. they puke crystal her until she stays at the school <laughs> so it's it's a little bit weird for her to like go on a day trip to learn about witches right especially after like you there's been two murders that you know of and your one real friend at the school has disappeared right and you've been kept on this weird diet of what looks like a raw piece of fish and a glass of poisoned wine yes <laughs> there's been maggots raining from the ceiling there's been puke crystals mm-hmm. like if the one person you trusted then disappeared, I'd be like, fuck this place. I'm never going back. Yeah. If I were to change it, mm-hmm. I would probably have her get that information from the um, the, the other the boy who's there. Yes. The because, one who has a little bit of a crush on her. Yeah. Because he doesn't yeah. really. So that's the other thing that's interesting about this movie is like yeah. there are a lot of characters who just disappear. Yes. Like uh, Olga. Olga. I fucking love Olga. Olga's great. I would like more Olga. Yeah. She uh, once... <laughs> I'm shocked she didn't end up being a witch. Well, I want to get into that in a minute. Ooh. Um, Once Susie moves back into the school from Olga's place, you do not see her again in the movie. Right. Uh, and the boy kind of disappears. I can't remember if he's involved at the end or not. I don't think he is, but but when they say that Sarah has run away, mm-hmm. he they kind of nudge him to make up a story to yeah. corroborate it. And he's like, "Oh, uh, yeah, I did, I did, I I saw her. She left around five thirty in the morning. Um, she got into like a beige c- car, like four wheels. It was beige. <laughs> you know, he gives like a really bad yeah. <laughs> story. Yeah. Um." And so I he he would make sense. However, yeah. uh, like there's there's other things too where like the first night when she doesn't stay there because the, they uh, yeah. they don't let her in. Yeah, I don't know where she goes, but she goes somewhere a hotel, and then just the she you don't see her really leave. I guess you see her in the car kind of drive off, and then she just walks back into frame. Yeah, the, the next, next day. morning. And so, which I I generally I don't mind because it does yeah. add to all of this stuff does add to this sort of dreamlike nature where there's some characters and then the characters are gone and right. then you know but um there are there I think that there is the first time I watched this I think I was confused about what's going on but I actually don't think it's very hard to follow um the only things that i that i do think are kind of up in the air and i think it's it's not a failing of the movie but it does leave you with questions that i don't think it has to answer cuz it's mm. kind of fun that they're there mm-hmm. is what exactly do they want with her mm-hmm. and secondly how many of those dancers are in on it because you could yeah. make the argument that all of the other girls most of them anyway mm-hmm. are actually witches in training or like they're in on what's going on olga seems like she would probably be <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know and clearly like pat hingle right and uh sarah right aren't right Susie shows up she's kind of new what are they doing with her like why are they trying to keep her sick like i'm not totally sure why they're going after her yeah um but ultimately i don't really know if it matters that much yeah, I I, I, th- I think that's what some of that um, exposition via psychiatrist is is supposed to be kind of giving you enough stuff to give you some like oh here's here's some information that could make several interpretations of what's going on here plausible. Yeah. yeah. It could be like is is this a coven? Like is this they're they're bringing these women these young women to the school to kind of figure out who has potential Mm -hmm. who who would be willing to join them are they bringing them just to make money and have a convenient front for what they're doing in the secret back room or is this like a human sacrifice situation sure like are they killing these girls slowly over time because there's some magic ritual that's giving them power or success or protection or whatever when they Mm -hmm. do it i don't know i think i think just like 
saying they're witches and they're malevolent and evil. You could just take any of those interpretations or more. Yeah. You know? Because, like, are they sapping power from Susie? Are they going after her specifically because she's asking too many questions? I think that's it. Because uh, uh, whatever they're trying to do with her... I think they accelerate the timeline a little bit with her mm. because they, they in, in that kind of right before the, the climactic moment um, when she's peeking, she's, she's gone through Ariadne style. She's gone through the labyrinth and found the, the coven of, of instructor witches in the back. And you hear Madame Blanche kind of saying um, she must vanish. Mm-hmm. The American girl must be disappear we must get rid of her and we must do it tonight yeah and it's sort of like clearly they know she's on to them right so i think it's more of a like the other girls i don't know about the other students because that night specifically everyone else is away right everyone else got tickets to go see the bolshoi yeah so which maybe on purpose yeah that's i mean my my i mean it's definitely on purpose but right <laughs> right my that made my initial interpretation that most if not all of the other students are not in on it mm-hmm. and they needed to get them all out of the house so that they could do away with Susie. yeah it's oh i guess they i guess they don't count on her walking in to find them right she's was, she's been drinking wine that right, is yeah. full of sleeping pills yeah um <laughs> I do, I do like the appearance of the my favorite Argento uh, trademark, which is the secret door or threshold. Yes. Literal, literal threshold that needs to be crossed. Yep. Um, a lot of that in this movie. Yeah. Threshold out of the airport, threshold mm-hmm. into the school. Yep. Yeah. Love it. Uh, and the only thing better than a magic book is magic Udo Kier, so I'm yeah. happy with that. <laughs> I, wish it was, I wish they just used his voice. His voice is so cool. Yeah, why didn't... Didn't so they? the whole movie is they didn't shoot with synced sound. Yeah, so cl- the, clearly. The, yeah, the whole thing. <laughs> I guess uh, Jessica Harper was saying it was really difficult to get used to because since they weren't syncing the sound, it mm. didn't mean that people had to be quiet. And so they'd be like shooting their scenes as you could hear like carpenters hammering shit oh and stuff. Oh my God. Yeah. And if you've worked on literally like any other type of project, you're probably like, uh, are we going to do something about that? Yeah. <laughs> and they, they were doing the, the thing they did a lot. Well, I... Maybe it's just how they did things in Italy full stop. But um, generally, since they're not shooting sync sound and they mm-hmm. got to dub it anyway, mm-hmm. you can have a, a lot of your actors don't need to understand what the other ones are saying. Right. And so, for instance, in the, the scene with Udo Kier, the second guy who comes over yeah. didn't speak English. And so he was just doing his lines in German. Oh, OK. And so basically, I guess Jessica Harper was having a really hard time tracking like where she should come in and stuff and so they developed like a system where when he was done he'd like tap her foot oh so she would know (laughs) that's when she should respond that's actually very sweet yeah and they did the same thing in the westerns like clint eastwood clint eastwood did the clint eastwood thing where he's like yeah it wasn't that hard you just wait till they stop talking and you say your line it's not a big deal (laughs) i mean that's a lot easier when your character is generally like stoic don't have to emote yeah (laughs) stony faced and terse yes um but yeah, it's 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 again it adds it adds so much to the weirdness factor of 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 how these these movies feel. Um but yeah, that that final the final sequence, I really for some reason I really love this the shot where she dumps the fish into the toilet. I don't know why it's so strange. <laughs> it's just this like fat slap of a well, side of fish. It's like, like a raw piece of fish though. Yeah, it's definitely not cooked. It's definitely yeah. not cooked. It's like pale and translucent and gross. Yeah. Yeah, which she just plops it right into the toilet and then <laughs> and then she proceeds to pour everything else on top of it. Yes. Like my favorite shot in the movie though. Yes. Is um I forget it's I think it's the beginning of the sequence where Sarah gets killed um, after she mm. realizes that Susie is, is asleep and, and yes, she can't wake she her up. she needs to sort of run away through the through the winding hallways. Yeah, but before she leaves the room, they do this thing where she's over by the door and the camera tilts up and so it's shooting through the light bulb and the mm. light bulb is still on mm. and so it's kind of obscuring what's going on and then she shuts the light off the whole room turns green, mm-hmm. and now she's sitting there 
inside the light bulb. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, Almost yeah. like she's trapped inside. The, it's so yes. cool. Yeah. And it's the kind of shot that doesn't make sense until they turn the light off, because otherwise it seems like this is kind of a weird... Right. Like, why Why bother doing this just uh, just to show off? And then it's like, oh, that's actually really cool. Yeah. It's, he does a lot of really great inventive camera stuff in this. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the lighting is amazing. The colors are fantastic. I love, I love when they, they after the maggots, <laughs> they set up to go to sleep in this big dormitory. They yeah, turn it's, the it's dance hall. Yeah, into I was going to say it's essentially like the performance space. <clears throat> They've just put cots out. Yeah. Yeah, and then they set the girls up and they go, "Okay, we're going to turn the lights off." And they turn the lights off, and the whole room t- lights up bright red, blood red. Yeah, and you and it's <laughs> and it's only sheets separating them from. The creepy wheezing creature on the cot, right on the other side of the sheet. Yes. Um, so how do you how, how do you feel about the final sequence there, where where uh, Susie goes and uh, confronts everybody, or confronts Helena at least? Yeah, I really like it. Yeah, I I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Like, <laughs> not not meaning like logic sense. I I just think it it fits really well with the movie mm-hmm. because like. She has sort of gone on this like hero's journey, like Susie throughout the movie, where mm-hmm. it's like maybe not as eventful <laughs> as some hero's journeys, but she starts off with like kind of like different characters acting as like guides or even like harbingers of other things to come. Mm-hmm. And then the, it keeps kind of slowly getting whittled down around her until it's just her. And then she has to sort of put together everything she's learned from the girls who came before her. Mm -hmm. Like she has to put together what she overheard Pat saying about the secret Iris. And then she has to put together, before that, she has to put together what Sarah was talking about with counting the steps Mm -hmm. and, and be using that as like a map to track her way through the, 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 the labyrinth that the school has become And so her finally putting those things together and then just like going and doing it by herself, I think is really cool. Yeah. Um, And I find it like satisfying, you know, (laughs) I find it a satisfying ending to a weird ass movie (laughs) when she goes back and she actually sees them and they are witches Mm -hmm. and they are evil. It's not some kind of cop out thing where it's like, oh, surprise, they're not witches, they're drug traffickers. (laughs) You you know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, that would be disappointing. Right? So, like, they they, they just kind of, they lean into it. It's, like, very atmospheric. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very cool looking. I think it's pretty tense. Because, yeah. like, she's alone. The school is empty. And she's kind of voluntarily walking into this danger. And you know it. Um, she starts getting sick because they're casting another spell on her to get sicker. And, right. Yeah. Right. And she kind of fights through it. And then the final showdown with Helena Marcos, I think initially i was ready to when the first time i saw this i was ready to be sort of like that's dumb mm-hmm. this, this old witch lady's just gonna be invisible that's a bad climactic fight and then the reanimated corpse of her dead friend comes right. running yeah, in and i was like her eyes. holy yeah. shit so like i i think it's really cool i really like it yeah my only the only thing that i don't like i it's not even don't like but it's just i feel like that last sequence when she's in the room with Helena Marcos Mm -hmm. it feels like the they're just trying to they're hustling through some concepts just to make sure that you get understand what's going on sure oh you're trying to kill me it's like yeah yes that's what's what's (laughs) I am Helena Marcos yeah we figured it out (laughs) we understand and uh you know I so that stuff just feels a little bit overly paced but uh sure but I I I love the stuff when the friend comes back Mm -hmm. uh that's very cool um I love the uh, seeing the outline from the of so she knows where to stab. That's yep. always good. Um, it's it's the classic Roger Corman school of horror movie endings where she walks out the door, the place is on fire, the monster's yep. dead. Roll credits. Yep. And uh, which I think is great because it fits with the rest of the. The kind of fairy tale feel oh, of the totally. whole thing. Like, what the fuck else are you gonna? What are you gonna watch right. her do? Go back to the airport, or like the cops pull up in yes. like a fire engine. God, you, I can't even tell you <laughs> how happy it makes me <laughs> that the cops do not show not up in the eleventh hour. A fucking cop, and there's there's yeah. <laughs> there's 
two scenes with cops. Mm-hmm. One after Pat dies, the sure. cops at the place, yep. they don't even have lines, I don't think. Yeah, and I don't even think they're they're I think maybe they're they're referred to as investigators or yeah. something, but it's very they're not called out. It's like, well, the police are here. Right. Yeah. And then the scene where the piano player gets killed, mm. there are two cops who run over to assist him. But that right. there's also, interestingly enough, I never noticed this before, mm. and I don't know if there's supposed to be different kinds of cops, but there's, so there's the two cops that run over in it to try to help him. Uh-huh. And then, but before that, as he's walking towards his death, yes. he walks by what look like German soldiers or something. Like they're yeah. very kind of like, I don't know if it's supposed to be because this is spo- this is Germany in the seventies. Yeah. So, uh, you it's you know you're you're dealing with either Western Germany or Eastern Germany depending on what side of the wall you're on. Right. And so I don't know if that's supposed to be. And interesting, if they went to see the Bolshoi. <clears throat> yeah, they must be in the eastern side of the wall. I don't know. I don't know, but there were not to get too in the weeds. I think I think. I think the Bolshoi actually typically got permission to tour oh, okay. throughout Europe because I think a couple times different dancers defected. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Not that it matters because that's not yeah. part of the story. Have you seen the remake? No. That actually plays pretty heavily into the remake is the, the fact that this is like the school yeah. directly looks onto the Berlin Wall in the in the remake. Huh. Yeah. I do want to see the remake. I love it. Really? Loved it. Really? Okay. Yes. I'm now I'm even more interested because I feel like most of the feedback I had heard about the remake was like, Ugh, don't do it. Saw it twice in the theater. Wow. Loved it. Yeah. Okay. Um but yeah, it's it's this movie is for taking place in Germany in the seventies, it's mm-hmm. completely apolitical. Yep. Uh it, it obviously much actually much like horror of Dracula, I think mm-hmm. he's choosing that uh environment. Yes. Because of the fairy tale aspect yes. of it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's more folklore. Kind of. Yeah, Grimm's yeah. fairy tales more so than like any sort of modern political commentary. Yeah. yeah. And it's also fairly asexual. Like there's it's yeah. It's sort of a hangover, I think, of the original idea where these are much younger girls. Yeah. But there it's it's not really you know, the <laughs> Olga is played as kind of like a sex kitten a little bit. But even there, yeah, for th- for this movie, yes, for this movie, yeah. <laughs> but even even there, it almost feels just like a like an act she's putting on, you know, right? Like she's trying to act like a grown up woman. Yeah. So yeah. it's not like there's and the way that they interact with each other is very childish. Lots of like sticking tongues out at each other. Yeah, and, like, you know, yeah. Lots raspberries of and teasing stuff. one another and <clears throat> kind of things. Yeah, and e- even the way that you know we we said the the other student, the young young man who clearly kind of has a little bit of a thing for Susie. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, it's very cute. Yeah, it's all you know? very... Like, he delivers her yeah. bags to her without her asking, and she's like, oh, you didn't have to do that. And he's like, but I wanted to. Yeah. And it's all very, like, he, he kind of, like, waves at her across the room and stuff. It's very, like, innocent and sweet. There's yeah. never a hint that it's like, ooh, so you're going to sneak into his room at night? Right, Like, yeah. no one says anything like that yeah and and it's the arguments over over the boy are very yeah juvenile yeah. and it's you're just mad because you had a crush on him and he didn't like you back right exactly <laughs> yeah so it's 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 fun in that way like it, it yeah. is definitely has a different vibe than most movies i think you're gonna you're gonna see yeah it is interesting because it, it it kind of combines these two different modes of like young and very innocent and naive combined with like really horrific things yeah. happening yeah so like people are murdered really brutally mm-hmm. but these girls feel very young right yeah so i think it is like very much one of those you know this the story of like losing your innocence and losing that naivete and yeah realizing that there are bad people in the world that do bad things yeah which is which is i Witches. man in any other movie in that scene when the the older guy is talking to her about witches and uh-huh. she's like have you ever seen a witch I, have you met a witch in before in any sir? other movie he goes ha, 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 i have been married 3 times <laughs> you know like any other movie yeah uh, yes oh, the other the other character i did want to call out just because i mm. i find this to be a, such an interesting deep cut is uh the doctor who juices her up oh yes dr vertigast uh-huh is his name 
uh, very unique name. Yes. Has to be a reference to the movie The Black Cat, mm. which was uh, um, Bell Lugosi and... Is this the one they made with, um, like, Taylor Swift was a cat person? No. <laughs> very much no. <laughs> uh, Bell Lugosi and uh, Karloff. I think it might have oh. been the first movie they did together. Really interesting movie. Huh. Uh, and... I can't remember which one plays him, but one of them, one of their characters is named Dr. Vitus Vertigast. Okay. Which has to be a, a direct allusion. Yeah. Recommend checking that movie out mm. because it is of the era of the universal stuff, mm. but it is really pushing the boundaries about what that movie, what the, sh- the stuff they're dealing with is, like contextually and like- Interesting. There's like this weird sadomasochist like bondage element to it that they hmm. can't show- But they can heavily hint at. But they can heavily hint at. (laughs) And it's like there's a lot of um, post-World War I kind of like Mm. trauma built into it. Very interesting movie. Cool. Uh, Is there anything else you want to talk about before we round it out? Yeah. We we definitely have to talk about Goblin. Yeah. Let's talk about Goblin. So you get Goblin from like minute one of this movie. Yes. They, Drum roll, please. Yes. <laughs> Goblin. So I guess they wrote and recorded the soundtrack before they shot the movie. Mm. And uh, But it's like you couldn't have picked a better soundtrack for this movie. Yeah, I'm really surprised to hear you say that because I feel like the music is so intrinsic to the action of this movie. Yeah. Like, like we were saying even so, stuff as simple as like cutting from Susie's face to a set of doors opening. You get like the musical cue right yeah, there it yeah. just feels so integrated that I'm... it's not the first time i've heard of that happening yeah uh i know once upon a time in the west they mm. did that uh, ennio morcone wrote the th- the score before they shot the movie cool and but they do it in very close uh contact with the director yes <laughs> so yeah. argento was very involved with the creation of the of the music and stuff, but yeah. uh, the goblins, as they are, yes, credited, they are credited as the goblins. Um, <laughs> it's it's one of the most iconic horror yeah. movie scores, and like it's I can't so imagine good. this movie without it. And the like, sort of like ch- chanting or s- just like moaning or screaming. I don't even know how to like the vocalizing in it. Right. Yeah. Is so perfect for the movie, where it's just like. You can kind of have it soft, or they can have it build. Yeah, and I think it's, it's used to very good effect. Very layered music, yeah. so you can go from like a little harpsichord kind of sound up yep. through the whole set, a uh, whole uh, orchestra, not orchestra, but yeah, the whole band, the whole band. Yes, <laughs> and uh, yes, Amanda and I got to see Claudio Simonetti's Goblin perform it live. Oh, they were so good, and it was really awesome. I actually I did watch the movie again today. Yeah. Because while we were at the show, I found myself watching the band trying to, I was like, okay, are they playing everything? Because it was so on point, like timing yes. wise and sound. Yes. That, I mean, obviously he's the guy who wrote it. He knows how to make the sounds, but no, it was, but it was, it was, it was so, so good. It felt so seamless and it felt so, yeah, yeah. There were definitely, I had, I had the same thing where there were moments where I was just like, wait, is that, is that part? pre-recorded because yeah. that's and it was like no no they're I doing even, it i think the drummer was doing the vocalizations he was doing at least some of some them. of them yeah. yeah i wouldn't be surprised if they had had to kind of maybe have a couple preset tracks that uh he had over there on a by the keyboard yeah, yeah. um claudio you could hit a button and be like okay here you go yeah this is the second movie i've seen like this with a live score i mm-hmm. i saw a couple of years ago i had gone to see fabio frizzi um mm. perform the score to lucio fulci's the beyond mm. which is it was you know very cool yeah uh this the funny thing about this though is as cool as it is mm-hmm. being there live having the your attention brought so much to the music yeah really makes it stand out that there's like one thing they do a l- over and over and over again in the movie, which is fine. Yeah. And I mean, that that's kind of, I, I feel like the case of many movie soundtracks mm. where, where you have a motif 
that you stick very, sure. very closely to. Sure. And also, if they pre-recorded it, it's like, here's your track. You got to just right, use this over right. and over again. You can use a slightly quieter version or more version. Yeah. Uh, the other one of these I've I've seen is um, we went one time to see the Boston Symphony Orchestra do uh, the live score to Jaws. Oh, cool. Which was awesome that's fun yeah it was, was great was it like four people like do you don't, do you need a full orchestra to do they that they did a full orchestra right. it was awesome yeah yeah it was in boston symphony hall the whole thing that's great yeah, yeah it was really cool bunch of stuffy people watching jaws yeah but the band was awesome it was uh uh it's claudio is the only member from official goblin mm-hmm. at this point um but the band that he put together was, was oh my really, god really good they were all it was like after we got out, I was like, man, that guitarist was amazing. Yeah. And you were like, yeah, he was great. The bassist was amazing. I was like, she was great. What yeah. about the drummer? He was awesome. Yeah. Like, they were all really, really impressive musicians. And they also, so after they finished the movie, they did a set of other Claudio Simonetti or Goblin yes. s- music. And that a lot of that, that music is so, can be so intricate and kind mm-hmm. of uh you know weird time signatures and stuff and kind mm-hmm. of prog rocky that it's uh i had never really thought about watching a band play it live yeah and so they were playing these songs and like the, they played the theme to tenebrae which has this amazing like uh kind of syncopated bass part to it yeah that was just killer yeah really really great yeah and they did uh they did the deep red yep they closed oh. with deep red uh, uh deep red theme and they did so um a couple tracks from dawn of the dead yep and uh tenebrae and uh what was that one with like the the, the card game i believe that was dario argento's the card player huh. which i have never seen but kind of made me want to watch it because that set, that theme was pretty rad yeah uh they also did the theme from demons which i was mm. very have you ever seen demons i have not we're gonna watch demons at some point i really want to after seeing because because when you know they they were playing the song and they had on the screen behind them, they were projecting highlights from yeah. these various movies. And so there were a bunch of, you know, clips and moments from Demons. And I was like, this movie looks awesome. Demons oh is fucking God. nuts. Like it's, I want to see that really bad. It has like such the thinnest thread of plot. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it needs much more than that. No, though. it's basically. I, I got the whole gist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where it's like, what if these things, something could make people start turning into demons? Basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's definitely it has the wildest soundtrack because there's the Claudio Simonetti stuff, mm-hmm. but then it also has a soundtrack of like needle drop songs, and it is the <laughs> strangest mix. It's Motley Crue, uh, Go West. Who, if you're not familiar with Go West, does the song uh, King of Wishful Thinking. Oh. Uh, it's got Rick Springfield, I think, is on there. Uh, <laughs> German heavy metal band Accept, I think, is on there. Oh. It is a very strange soundtrack. Huh. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm excited. I want to see that. Yeah, we're going to watch that eventually. I'm going to use that for a wild card at some point. Nice. Um, yeah, but I mean, I think I think that's about it. I mean, Goblin is, is, the, is the secret sauce to this movie, I think, that really yes. pulls the whole thing together. I mean, there's a reason why he used them so many times. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's something that's just so. I don't know. Yeah, I, I feel like it, like this movie is so much about the visuals and the sounds mm-hmm. that if you lost one or the other, you know, like if they didn't have quite that like the way they light things in this movie and the colors they use in the sets, I think if you didn't have that, it wouldn't be the same movie. Even if you were telling the same story, mm-hmm. and I think Goblins kind of this is the other piece of that like if you if you took the goblin soundtrack out of this it just there'd be moments that just didn't feel like they had as much of an impact yeah yeah yeah. do you um do you think that this is a dumb question (laughs) ask it do you do you think going off of kind of what what we were talking about with bird with the crystal plumage do you Mm. think that the style being the thing bringing you to the table is enough is it enough for you because i can see this i would say this more so than bird with the crystal plumage Mm. um everything kind of works together pretty well because like i said i feel like the story ultimately is fairly simple yeah 
Um, but I can see it not being enough for some people because they might watch this and go, this doesn't make any sense. What's going on? Why is everything red? Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I can see that there would be people who felt that way and I wouldn't begrudge them mm-hmm. that feeling. I disagree. You know, I really, I really like movies like this. I yeah. feel like there is something kind of reaching back in this movie, not only towards fairy tales, but towards mythology. Sure. You know, yeah. like Theseus and the Minotaur and all of that. And like, they even mentioned there's like a throwaway line where she said it's like Ariadne's thread. Sure. And well, I mean, the the room of uh, the woman who runs the place where the, yeah. the irises and stuff are, yeah. the wallpapers are covered with like Escher, M.C. Escher drawings yeah. that are very uh, labyrinthian. Exact, exactly. And yeah. I, so I feel like movies like this. Labyrinthine? E- Labyrinthine. Lab- Labyrinthine. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I feel like movies like this, when when they have more ideas that they're playing with, mm-hmm. like this one does, like Deep Red does, where they're sort of, like, even if it's just an artistic framework underneath, there's enough there to keep me interested. Yeah. I, I do agree with you, though. I, I, I do think that there are some people who would watch this and just sort of be like, why did I sit through that? Yeah. But... I- it's such an assault on all your senses <laughs> yes it is and i mean that in the best way possible agree because it's just the colors are so bright and the yep. music is so intense and like mm-hmm. jarring and the violence mm-hmm. is so intense and jarring yeah but also strangely beautiful and there's lots of ups and downs it's it is it, it, i can under i can see why it has the um standing that it does speaking of which it's number 66 on our list Mm -hmm. do you think that's too low too high do you like it where it is i kind of like it where it is i do too i feel pretty good about it (laughs) like it's obscure enough that i don't think it should be in like the top 20 or Mm -hmm. something um i i I think it's had a huge impact but at the same time a, a large impact in a niche of horror do you know what i mean it's tough though because like if I think of 1970s horror movies, mm-hmm. I mean, this is like one of five I'm going to name. You know, it's Yeah, but I but I do think it has that like we were just saying kind of kind of that it's not for everyone sure. kind of thing sure. and I I don't know. I I if you told me it was closer to 50, I'd be like sure, yeah, yeah. yeah bring it over to that but I, I i i understand why it's not breaking people's top 25 because when you think horror movies i think so many people are gonna you know jump straight towards i don't know pick a dracula movie you know what i sure, mean like yeah. more in that vein than than this 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 one is it's kind of out there the whole giallo subgenre is kind of out there and if it's not your thing it's typically really not your thing <laughs> yeah man what a what a decade for horror movies. You had, <laughs> in the same decade, in the, in the same 10 years, you had mm-hmm. Black Christmas, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The mm-hmm. Exorcist, mm-hmm. Suspiria, uh, Halloween. Yep. And then, depending on where you want to draw your line, uh, Alien and Friday the 13th, if you want to go up to 1980. Yeah. Which is, that's, that's it's a hell of a decade. It's quite a run. Uh, anyway, I think that's going to do it for Suspiria. I, I yes. do also, I like the placement. Um, would you recommend this? With reservations? Yes. Yeah. Like it would really depend on who I was talking to. If, if you're, if you're someone who's more into the straight up, like slasher horror movies, or you really like monster movies or stuff like that. I might say like, yeah, try it, but mm-hmm. don't, you know, like yeah. if you don't like the first 20 minutes, you're probably not going to like the movie. That's fair. It's it's one of those. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, overall, I think if, if, if you're open to it or if it sounds intriguing to you, you should go for it. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I, this is probably one I would just say you need to see Suspiria regardless of. Yeah. <laughs> just, just to have seen it and to know yeah. what it is. This yeah. is definitely one where if someone's like, what should I watch? And I'm like, have you seen Suspiria? And they're like, no, if you're coming at me for a recommendation and you haven't seen this, I'm going to tell you to watch it. <laughs> um, shit, what the hell was I going to say? Uh, I think 
for me, mm-hmm. I have come around a lot in the years. I've probably watched this maybe five or six times at this point. Mm-hmm. And I do like it more every time I watch it. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited to revisit Inferno, which is mm-hmm. the follow up to this. Mm-hmm. Because I haven't watched that one in a long one. time. And for a long time, I was always like, eh, Suspiria is okay. Inferno is where it's at. Hmm. So, which is generally not a popular opinion. So, interesting. Um, it's going to be curi- interesting to, to come back to Inferno and, and see uh, if it holds up for me. Nice. Um, but yeah, I think that's going to do it for, for us on Suspiria. Yes. If you would like to, thank you for listening. If you'd like to help support our show, you can head over to patreon.com slash the Penske file. Sign up for our Patreon where you can listen to us talk about this year. We've been talking about the second string of Stephen King films. November is Pet Cemetery, and we're rounding mm. it out next month with Stephen King's It from 1990. Yes. And we just put up our poll, our Patreon poll, to see what we're going to do next year. And so if you'd like to hear us talk about that, you're going to have to come to the Patreon and hear it. Yeah. Come vote on what you want. So, Amanda. Yes, Clay. You are up. It is a wild card choice. We are at the wild card moment again. Yes. What have you got in store for us for next time? Uh, I would like to do something completely different Mm -hmm. than what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. I feel like we've been in a very giallo slash kind of classic monster moment Mm -hmm. recently. Um, I want to make you watch We're All Going to the World's Fair. I have never heard of that movie. Really? Yes. Okay. All right. It's been uh, like, it's it came out maybe end of twenty twenty one, early twenty twenty two. Okay. It's so it's recent. It's 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 a recent indie horror movie that's very. Uh, from what I know of it, it's very up my alley. Yeah. Okay. It's very small, I'm, small cast, creepy shit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna say. I'm not excited about this. You're not excited or about that this. You, that, you, that you need to broaden your horizons. But I feel like everyone you've suggested is from like the last 10 years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, probably. But I, Except but for I, Innkeepers. Innkeepers was a little bit. But still, that was still yeah. a 2000s movie. I, whatever, what, whatever happened to Baby Jane? That's true. Come Good on. Yeah. Come on. Yep. I, I, have, I have some variety. Well, we did watch the remake of what, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane that had like... Uh, Sophie Turner and uh, no, I'm just kidding. I can't think of another. <laughs> top of my head. It's like I have no idea where this is going. No. I'm very confused. I feel like I tend to go for the more modern horror movies because I think you have so much of the '80s, mm-hmm. the '70s, '80s ones kind of on lock. That's fair, and so. I'm al- I'm always looking forward to to finding new modern stuff anyway. And I've yeah. liked I've liked pretty much everything. <laughs> I think I think in, I think that was with such a face. <laughs> no, I think a dark song is the only one that it didn't. That really you were just like I do can't do this. Me. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, yeah, no, that's 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 excellent. I'm looking forward to that. I haven't heard of it. I'm always looking for something new to watch. So mm-hmm. next time we will be doing. We're all going to the world's fair. So uh, thank you guys for listening and thank you for the support. And we will see you next time. Bye.